minister. <laughs> but it doesn't mean to say we, we lost our, um, our, our roots. And it was great to see on your book that Pretoria, whites only signs, because I spent my childhood in Pretoria, where my parents were in the anti-apartheid struggle. They were both uh, jailed and then issued with banning orders. I think they were the first married couple to be banned. One of the clauses in a banning order was you couldn't communicate with another banned person. They banned my mum in 1963 and my dad a year later, and then they suddenly realised they had to give them exceptional permission to talk to each other. <laughs> so they had special clauses inserting in their banning orders, which were pretty unique at the time. And what um, all of these comrades did was absolutely fantastic, and they'll speak about it. I'll just give you one other little uh, anecdote. My only encounter with this kind of thing, because a number of you said to me this evening that you'd been recruited but you never told me, and quite right too, this had to be done in total secrecy. My only encounter, I don't know if you know this, Ronnie, was that in 1977, on the recommendation of Basil Manning, who was then Executive Secretary of the Anti-Apartheid Movement, I had these two guys from Okela, which was purported to be a white um, dissident organization of whites who would not sign up, to the armed, sign up to the armed forces and in the resistance. And they approached me and tried to persuade me to join them and to come into South Africa on some kind of uh, uh, guerrilla basis. I was pretty suspicious of them and I said to them, look, you know, I've been announced out there as public enemy number one. My photos everywhere from having stopped all the, been involved in stopping all the, uh, the, the Springbok white uh, cricket and rugby tours. You know, I'm an enemy. They'd sent me a letter bomb, which fortunately in my case, unlike Ruth First and Dulcie September and so many other anti-apartheid leaders around the world, didn't blow me up because there was a technical fault in it. They'd uh, produced two trials against me. I can't go over the border anonymously in a way that Ken and colleagues with John were able to do. Then I found out, so I said no, and then I found out some years later that they were actually working for Craig Williamson. Uh, who some of you will remember was the master spy operating in anti-apartheid circles at the time. So, um, welcome, as I say, to Parliament, the place where in the 1980s, there are now MPs here who in the 1980s, I remember sitting on the Conservative benches, I should just remind you, who in the 1980s were wearing Hang Nelson Mandela badges in student union meetings, which I was speaking at, along with many others in the anti-apartheid movement right across the country. And of course, it's not so long ago since Margaret Thatcher, when she was Prime Minister, denounced Nelson Mandela as a terrorist. We've come a long way. We're celebrating that fantastic road uh, to freedom and resistance and the ultimate victory, and no better person to start it off than the great Ronnie Castles. Welcome, Ronnie. Yeah. Well, thanks to Peter Hay for so many things, for having a house full of subversives here and not minding, um, but for so many things that he had done in South Africa and from South Africa, and I dare say one of South Africa's finest exports to the United Kingdom. <laughs> um, I would have recruited uh, Peter as well if he hadn't risen to such prominence here yeah, as the hate figure of apartheid. Most of the travellers that we sent to South Africa, I was some kind of glorified travel agent, actually. <laughs> and these agents that we sent in, as Peter has remarked, were not really known. Although, Peter, they had been on many a demonstration with you. Absolutely. One of them, actually, in his passport, had a photograph in a jacket, and the Communist Party, the Young Communist League badge was in the lapel. <laughs> but they didn't notice it when he went through customs and immigration in South Africa. As you can hear, many of them are here. <laughs> um, this is a remarkable book, and it is a book that so closely unites, I'm not going to say Britain, because many of the recruits were from far afield. Sean Hosey here, Peter, who served five years in Ambaris, uh, from Greece, and his wife from France. But um, the essential thing was that they had white skins, 
and they were able to travel to South Africa without much suspicion, although there were hate figures like Joe Slobo, like Peter Hayne and others who were white. But the police and white society were so psyched up about the Svat Gefar, the black peril, that if you were a white huffer, and if you were born in prison, by the way, Sue Rabkin's mother, uh, daughter, <laughs> Franny Great. <laughs> Rapkin is just a footnote here with uh, David, her late father, who unfortunately died in that goal in an accident, would have been here. She didn't write her piece. But essentially, it's about the travelers, about the smugglers, about these guys out of the anti-apartheid milieu, caught up in the 1960s, that whirlwind period, and were prepared to brave all sorts of dangers and the kind of dangers that Sean and Alex subsequently had to face, that unbearable agony of being captured and serving time in prison after brutal treatment. But everybody really uh, prepared to go, young men and young women, when I look at them, I see 20-year-olds. I don't see these grey-haired, <laughs> corpulent, <laughs> middle-aged types. Because I still think of myself as the life Ronnie Caswell's of the <laughs> sabotage period. Um, the book, by the way, Peter, could well have been called Exploding Buckets. <laughs> Ken Keeble's item in here is called Exploding Buckets. We then prefer London recruits. Well, <laughs> I, I dare say you probably would have hesitated to host a book launch here of exploding <laughs> buckets. <laughs> Ken is a remarkable guy who went to extraordinary lengths to get these recruits of ours to put down paper what they had sealed in their minds, and many of them were rather reluctant, and everybody was exceptionally modest. But um, through all sorts of charm and guile and so on, he managed to assemble contributions from 32, no less. Tabo Mbeki, just the other day, at his 70th birthday, we had half a dozen of the recruits in South Africa, and he met them uh, while we were having a few whiskeys with him in his office. His wife came in and said, Tabo, it's your birthday party Sunday invite them and indeed they were invited and it was quite remarkable because in the speech he made he paid special tribute to them as did the deputy president of the country Khalima Motlanti who they met in Lutuli house as did the head of secretary general of Kasatu um, as Vavi, Zuelan Zima Vavi and the outpourings from all of them astonished these very <coughs> modest recruits because everybody, and it was not just leaders, but people in the streets, they were on television, given that there was an interview on TV one breakfast morning with that fellow over there, a smuggler's device called a suitcase with a, a false bottom, state-of-the-art stuff made up by Jack Hodgson, who you would have known, in 1969, and it still exists. One was brought to South Africa, and Morning TV had a couple of us being interviewed with the recruit who had brought that in. In no time, the whole country knew about this, and they were stopped in the streets by workers, by housewives, by shoppers saying, you the guys with the suitcase. <laughs> it made an incredible impression on South Africa. What I wanted to say about Mbeki's speech, apart from his fulsome praise, was he made this extremely important point, which I've made in my introduction, by the way, so read it all there. But he made the point that this was a period, and Peter has alluded, to what became the reign of terror in South Africa post Sharpeville, the banishments, the restrictions, the bannings, of course the Ravonia raid, the imprisonments for life, the torture chamber and the executions. Hangman's Knot in Pretoria was working overtime. Um, the people in South Africa, 
and the organization was cracked, the people were incredibly intimidated, and there was this huge lull from the mid-60s to early 70s. I managed to escape and found my way to London and in a Good Street office, very moldy office, seedy sort of set up, um, Yusuf Dadu, Joe Slovo, Jack Hodgson and I, we'd done the analysis, this is what Mbeki came to refer to, and that analysis was the same as what he recounted. It was quiet in South Africa. We desperately needed the message of resistance to get across to the people. Don't forget our leaders. The ANC lives. We will revive, organize, etc. Um, so we're sitting in this office, had done that analysis. Tambo Oliver had done the same in Dar es Salaam. And the point was, we've got to first recruit people who prepared to go into the country and smuggle in leaflets. Three sets of elderly eyes swiveled around to the youngster there, just a bit older than you, Peter. And they all gazed at me and they said, OK, Ronnie, that's your job. Which brought me into contact with what people actually, in a swear word way, in a loose way, call people Stalinists and trots. The damn trots and those awful Stalinists. And the Young Communist League workers, trade unionists, youngsters, young men and women, wonderful to see a number of the women here, um, were people we identified. And then I was at the LSC pretending to study, registered there, and started chatting people in the Socialist Society, the den of the trots, like Sabi Seagull there and, and, and John Rose here, and befriended them. And they thought of me as a, a Stalinist because of the South African Communist Party and upholding Mother Russia and all that, but we got on very well. And it was really from their ranks that the recruits were chosen. They didn't know of each other. They'd go into South Africa. They would take in the suitcases, filled and crammed in the false bottom with leaflets, with some devices, uh, schoolboy type stuff, put the leaflets in buckets, bit of uh, gunpowder um, <coughs> in the bottom with a timing device. And these would be left in shopping bags at crucial points around the factories and the railway stations, etc., and go off at a particular time. And there would be something like um, 12 teams or 20 teams even of two people each in the five, six main cities of, Jah of South Africa. And these devices would go off at the same time with uh, street broadcasting devices being activated as well. And they made an incredible impact. And this is what Tabo Mbeki was referring to. The five or so years that it took us to reorganize and revive an underground, these recruits played this incredible role of in the silence, breaking the silence, going through, cutting through that void, and helping us to spread the message to the people of South Africa. Very cheeky propaganda indeed, Peter, you'll see in your book there. Um, there, there are facsimiles of newspapers uh, dealing with the distributions, and they quote from one of the leaflets scattered in 1970. Of course, you will work out that's 20 years before the ANC is unbanned, and it says defiantly, we say to Foster and your gang, your days are numbered. <laughs> Um, of course, it, took, it did take place 20 years later, and thanks to the enormous support we received internationally, the anti-apartheid struggle epitomized that. And Peter here in the sports boycott epitomized that to a tremendous degree. There's a reference from one of the recruits in his insert about coming to this hotel. He sent them to very cheapo hotels, you know, um, and they'd book into these hotels and inevitably in the hotel at reception there would be a tin, this is circa 70s, a tin for collection of funds and it would have the label, Give Hain Pain, 
because this court case was going against Peter here and the money, the prosecution was actually driven by South African money and it was being collected in that way. But we gave them pay through the London recruits, the work they did and as, Be as Mbeki said, their contribution was absolutely incalculable and in terms of that, it went on to even greater things. Stuart Brown over there and others, Pete Smith over there, one of the recruits went on to work for us for 20 years. And from these devices that come out of a school science lab, the, the, the exploding devices, we had people who did approach the kind of commitment of the uh, International Brigade and that was in terms of smuggling the weapons of war, which from Conto we says we needed. We'll come back to the case a little later on. Peter's going to have to leave a bit earlier, um, but he's asked me to take over chair at 7.30, Peter, right? So at, on this note, let me turn to the editor of the London recruits and also one of the travellers we sent in, Ken Keeble. I'm delighted, absolutely delighted, to have such a fantastic group of people here today. Uh, there have not been as many of the London recruits together in one place since 2005, and there's more, there's more than that now than there were on that occasion. Um, I, uh, as many of you know, if you've read the book, I, I went, went to uh, uh, Johannesburg in 1968 to post 1,200 letters, uh, and I went to uh, Durban in uh, 1970, where I was with my friend Pete Smith, who's here today. Where's he gone? Um, yeah. Uh, sorry, oh, yeah, yes, Pete Smith. <laughs> and uh, we, we, uh, we set off some leaflet bombs and, and uh, a, a street broadcast, and uh, we didn't know that it was being done in five cities simultaneously, because Ronnie only told you what you needed to know. You know. Um, I, I, was, um, I was born into a communist family. I had an enormous advantage of having a communist mother as well as a communist father. In fact, my father's passport said on it that he could go anywhere in the world except the British Empire. Because he was, <laughs> he, he was, he was completely British, he was a great public speaker and a great uh, political campaigner. And um, anyway, uh, I joined the Young Communist League at the age of 13, and uh, in 1967, George Bridges, who's down here, uh, he was the London District Secretary of the, the YCL at the time, he approached me and asked me if I was willing to do something illegal which has surprised me somewhat, you know, and hadn't had that before. And um, the outcome was that, uh, that uh, in, in the following year, uh, he introduced me to Ronnie, who sent me off uh, on this mission to Johannesburg. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there's been an extraordinary um, uh, dedication to secrecy on behalf of everybody involved. And that's why it's taken so long to get this book. This book could have been done ten years earlier. And I started it in 2005, because I'd reached the age of 60, and I asked myself, what have I got to do before I die? People call it a bucket list, I understand, when you kick the bucket, you know. <laughs> uh, if I, uh, when, I, when I feel death approaching, what would I most regret not having done? And when I asked myself that question, I knew that I had to write this story of what I'd done in South Africa on those two occasions. And, uh, and when I'd written my story, I then thought of this idea of just trying to track down the others. And I really had very little idea who they were, how many they were, or what they'd done. It's all been a, a, a great um, a discovery since then, uh, of this amazing operation, which I only knew a tiny fraction of. Uh, and so it's been a beautiful experience for me, a really beautiful experience, collecting the stories in, discussing them with people, uh, and, and editing them, and just getting one after another, and saying, well, amazing, another one, just fantastic. I just didn't know this was all, all going on. And uh, some of them were very reluctant to, uh, to write their stories, uh, some people, in fact, couldn't be persuaded at all. Uh, some people wrote under a pseudonym because um, they're senior positions in their professions or something of some such reason. Uh, and, um, but um, many of them just straight away. Some of them took a long time to persuade. But they, they've got this terrific collection of, uh, of um, stories. Just my commission. Yes, welcome. To you. uh, you're very welcome, sir. Hi. Thank South you. South African High Commission. High Commission. Right. Right. Um, 
Yes, the secrecy. And uh, we've recently discovered in the last few days there are two women here uh, who were working together in the same office for 10 years in the 70s and 80s. Both of them were London recruits and neither of them knew that the other was. <laughs> and that, that's, that's a, a sign of this, this huge commitment to secrecy, which explains, as I say, why you know, it took so long to get this done. When I um, had the idea, um, I first of all, uh, I think I, the first thing I did was, was to find uh, George Bridges on the, uh, in the London Telephone Directory, and he immediately said yes, he'd help me with this project, and started giving me names, because he recruited a lot of people. Because the job of recruitment, the main job of recruitment within, was within the Uncommunist League, and the London District Secretary of the YCO was given the job of recruitment, and his successor, Bob Allen, who's here as well, uh, over there, he, he inherited the job, much to his surprise, when he took over the job from, from George. And, um, um, I was saying, yes, the, 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 the secrecy. I, I want to, I want to um, just clarify some, some points. Oh, I know, I've just seen this story for a minute. What happened was I then, I then emailed Ronnie, who was by this time was a minister, and I had read his book by then, the, the first edition, the 1993 edition of his book, Armed and Dangerous, in which he had a chapter called London Recruits, and that's where we get the name. And uh, so it told a small amount of the story, but he, that was, this was before the complete fall of the apartheid regime, and obviously, and he didn't put names in there that weren't in the public domain and so on. Um, but uh, I emailed Ronnie, and I said, Dear Ronnie, do you remember me? Because it was over 30 years since we'd been in touch, and I didn't know who would. But he wrote back saying, yes, he did remember me, and that he regarded it as a sacred duty to help with this project and get this book done. And he's been a tremendous support, and it couldn't have really been done without it, I think. He started giving me names and information and so on. Um, and then uh, he uh, arranged with the uh, then High Commissioner to have a, uh, a reception in, in the High Commission in London, in Trafalgar Square, for all those people that we discovered at that point. This was just you know, about three months after we'd started the project. The people we then contacted immediately all came together at this wonderful reception, and we all sort of looked at each other. Wow, I didn't know you were involved, and uh, so on and so on. People we didn't know at all. Uh, people we'd regarded at the time as sort of on the other side of some political divide, you know, um, in various ways. But uh, some of us were in the South Africa on the same day doing exactly the same thing, uh, which is a lesson for us today, I think, you know, not to be sectarian, not to let our, you know, I didn't know. Yeah. interviewed a good many times in the last few weeks in South Africa, because we had a tour of South Africa in most of June, and also in, in Britain, and it's starting to pick up now, the media started getting interested in Britain. I was on Br Bristol local radio yesterday morning, uh, and, uh, and Somerset local radio in, in earlier in the morning. Um, uh, there's a, there's, there was an article in The Observer last Sunday, there's going to be an article, as far as I know, in the Sunday Mirror this Sunday, and The Guardian are now talking to me about it as well. Uh, so it's beginning to get uh, media interest in this country. And um, uh, I, I've found there's an awful lot of confusion that I've met from people, just people in meetings, but also interviewers, journalists, about international solidarity. The one we had in Bristol, he seemed to, uh, very confused, he sort of thought that maybe international solidarity was, uh, was um, what we did was somehow comparable to Britain bombing Libya. Um, <coughs> you know, terrible confusion. I think one thing really needs to be said, it's very, very important, that apartheid was a crime, a crime against humanity, um, and against human dignity and self-respect. And Britain was up to its neck in the crime of apartheid. It's very important to understand. All the major British businesses had their subsidiaries in South Africa. They were discriminating against their customers and against their staff on grounds of race. Uh, they were implementing the apartheid system, cooperating with it. All the City of London financial institutions uh, were profiting from the apartheid system, and the whole British economy was being subsidised by the cheap labour of the South African people. And the British government, successive governments, uh, uh, did what they always do to protect British investments wherever they are, you know, every, every place where Britain's got investments, they protect them. And so they were um, behind the scenes diplomatically at the United Nations and elsewhere minimising, uh, trying to minimise every attempt to isolate the regime. And uh, that, that's, that's what needs to be said. That's what justified what we did. It wasn't just compassion. You know, if, if it was just compassion, 
I could spend my time uh, working for the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. That would be compassion. I wouldn't have to go to South Africa to do it. It's not compassion. Uh, although I do have compassion, I did have compassion for the South African people. But it's because our government was up to its neck in the crime of apartheid. And that's, that's why it was right for us to stand up and say, not in my name, I'm going to do something about this. It wasn't just interfering in the affairs of some other country that didn't concern us. I also want to say, and I've said this um, in South Africa many times in the, in the tour, um, the defeat of the apartheid system uh, struck a he powerful blow against racism all around the world, but especially in Britain, because it's very close links with South Africa. And uh, my grandchildren are growing up in a Britain that is much less racist than the one I grew up in. And that's not only because of the defeat of apartheid, but it's certainly partly for that reason. In the early 90s, when Mandela was released and, and the, 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 we had the elections in South Africa, people saw it on TV, and at that time, uh, racism suddenly became unacceptable in parts of British society where previously it had been acceptable. And it was a major shift at that time. So I think, you know, what I said there to the people who were uh, anxious, you know, to, 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 to thank us in South Africa, I said, no, we've already been thanked. We've already been thanked because you helped us to defeat or to minimise racism, reduce racism in Britain. I think that's that's a very important point. And that's an example of the, the, the uh, South African trade union slogan, an injury to one and an injury to all. It's also true that a victory for one is a victory for all. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an important point to make. Um, uh, we've, um, we've decided to set up a, uh, a website uh, uh, Dennis, uh, Dennis um, Welsh, his daughter, uh, she was touring with us in South Africa. They're both on holiday. They, they, when the rest of us came home, they uh, stayed on for a bit of tourism in South Africa. They, um, uh, sh she's uh, got very enthusiastic about the whole thing, very proud of what her father did, and, uh, and she, um, she's going to set up a different website when she gets back so that any new stories that we gather in, we can put them up on the website if people are willing to write the stories, because there's several people who have come forward since the book was published, and I hope that all, and some of them are here today, I hope they'll all write something uh, that can go on the website to tell more of the story. There's, the, there's, somebody, there's two people here who, um, who, in 1973, they were sent in and they're told to buy a duplicator. You remember, old, if you're old enough to remember, you'll remember duplicators, and, uh, and, and, and print their own le le letters. <laughs> so now, I couldn't believe it when I heard that. Uh, so uh, that's another a twist to the story. Um, and uh, we're going to head on to that. Um, yes, uh, I think I think the other thing, the final thing I want to say is that uh, the world's more integrated now than it was. It's getting more integrated every day, and that makes it more and more difficult to sustain the view that what happens in some distant country is, is not my problem. You know, it doesn't affect me. The value of the money in your pocket can be affected by events in Tahrir Square or in Beijing or somewhere else. It's all inter interrelated. And, uh, and there's a great thing, there's still plenty that we in Britain can do. And I want to mention, and I know it's a, a, a thing that's dear to Ronnie's heart as well, the Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Yeah. Nelson Mandela has said that the Palestine question, uh, the plight of the Palestinian people, is the major moral issue, the great moral issue of our time. And there's a great many parallels between that and this, and I think we need to build the kind of solidarity movement modelled very much, in many ways, on the old anti-apartheid movement to get that kind of feeling in the country that, that millions of people will say, no, I, I, want, to have, I want to boycott uh, Israeli goods to, uh, and to boycott the Israeli state for, um, in protest against this injustice. So I think we want to say that. So I, I think what we need uh, in the 21st century is more and more and more international solidarity. I'll leave you with that thought. Yeah. formally hand over to, to Ronnie, just to thank you very much for coming this evening, and you've got a great meeting ahead of you. Royal, the, the books are for sale in the back. They're all gone. Oh, they're all gone, are they? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, all the royalties go to the Mel Mandela, Delson Mandela Children's Fund, so perhaps pass the word around about that. I was intrigued by the remark earlier about 
some of the comrades going in with the YCL badges and not being noticed. <laughs> Reminded me of, this, of, of what happened. The South African apartheid authorities used to censor loads of publications from abroad. And they were looking down this list in the early 60s and they came across Black Beauty. <laughs> <laughs> so that was censored. <laughs> they didn't know it was about a horse. Uh, so there we go. I, 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 um, I, I'm now going to leave you in charge. The House of Commons has just adjourned, so this room of subversives is entirely in charge of the whole of Parliament. <laughs> 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 Well, a very warm thank you to Peter Hayne. Peter, we really appreciate the time you've given us. Thanks so much. And, and of course, uh, ladies and gentlemen, comrades and friends, you, uh, you have heard that the South African High Commissioner has joined us. Zola Skwaye, Johnny Naplanje Baba. Thanks for being here. Uh, do you want to shift up yeah. a little? Uh, since we are in power now, <laughs> when, the, when, when the smuggler suitcase is brought in, everything intact there, Tom. Should we open it up and reveal what we've got? <laughs> uh, we'll just take this moment um, to show you. There's nothing in the, the bag, but... Uh, yeah, I... Um, I do you want to come around this yes, side? I an aeroplane to Cape Town in August 1970 with this. Oh, can you go down this side? Yeah, all right. You do it from this way, like a good magician. Can you all see it? Yeah, there I was in that play with my big brother there. We were the fabulous Belbros then, we're the old farts Belbros now. But uh, we, um, we, we took these cases and the, this lining, as you can see, they've been stuck in with this false bottom. Uh, when, when it was in place and you looked in there, your eyes just went into, you know, into, into sort of spinning. Uh, and so uh, that, that was the way it was hidden. Um, having got there and done the job and finished it, I thought, what the hell, one more risk. Uh, we'll take this back with us. And, uh, and it's followed me around ever since for the last, you know, 40 years. Uh, I'm going to offer it to the Museum of Labour in Manchester so that there'll be one case in South Africa and one here on display. Uh, and I think that's the right thing. Well, I, I've been using it up to last year for my holidays, so I don't have to... <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to get a new case now. <laughs> uh, but there you go, that was it. It was uh, quite, uh, quite ingenious, wasn't it, the way it worked? So simple, <laughs> yet so ingenious. Yeah, you'll see the size of this case. Tom had one and I had one each. And honestly, when I first saw it, I thought perhaps somebody would be put Tom in the bottom of it. <laughs> it was so huge. Yeah. And uh, when it's all full of the stuff, it was quite heavy struggling through the customs for that. Yeah. Sense. It was, uh, yeah. I don't think we get as far as Ethrow car park. <laughs> <laughs> But in those days, yeah, we did. So that's it now. A uh, little bit of history of the anti-apartheid movement, which I shall be very sad uh, to relinquish, but I realise that's what's got to be done. <laughs> Thanks. We'll take questions later. Is Graham White here? Yes. Where, where is Graham? Oh, Graham's over here. Um, Graham didn't come out to South Africa. But the group that did brought with his suitcase and he has donated it to the Ravonia Museum in South Africa, the Lilies Leaf Museum. So it's there safely, soundly, and uh, they greatly appreciate this, Graham. Thanks very much for your generosity. But actually, the ANC did pay for these suitcases. <laughs> Uh, we're calling on John Rose to give us a little bit of his experience. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much. I want to begin by thanking British imperialism for my very nice middle-class accent, and I'll explain why I want to do this. 
I think it's on page 98, you'll find a brilliant uh, chapter by, unfortunately he's not here tonight, my second comrade in arms, that's the right expression, perhaps it isn't, um, on my second trip, Mike Malott, who described in detail our, our general experience, one particular experience, we're sitting in a Durban car park, and, and, and we have three bucket bombs in, pl in, in, in brown paper bags, and all three of them are ticking. That's a very important point, they're ticking. <laughs> And in the, de in the description, the ticking seems to get louder. And we've got ten minutes to go before we're supposed to plant these, uh, the bucket bombs. And three Afrikaner policemen come <coughs> towards us and ask us to wind down the window. And they explain that there's uh, been a, a rash of robberies and they're very interested in the packages on the back seat. <laughs> and uh, this is Mike's description, I barely remember it. But by some, and it was a fluke. It was a fluke, but this fluke was me saying, me hearing myself say, Officer, we're British tourists. And I put my arm down on his arm, and he backed off. <laughs> it was absolutely extraordinary. And had that not happened, we would have shared the same fate as Sean Hosey, who I think is going to speak later on. So it was we were that lucky. So in, it's a double sense, not just British imperialism for my accent, but the Afrikaner policeman thought a British tourist was so important that the very word of British tourists was enough to stop them investigating for them, which would have been a major uh, a breakthrough, not just an ordinary crime, but a political crime. So if we'd never fi find those Afrikaner policemen, I'd be, I'd be the first to uh, congratulate them a second time. I think the anecdotes in this book are absolutely magnificent, and I just want to get, touch on one or two of them. I mean, one of the, the most um, exciting points for me, it was unfortunately one of, the, uh, one of the schemes that failed, but Ronnie recruited with others in the Communist Party in Britain, seamen and experts in shipping, and they actually got hold of a ship to take guerrillas around the coastline to, uh, uh, to get them to, to smuggle them into, in, into South Africa. Unfortunately, they were rumbled or the ship broke down. It was just a, that's a, a measure of the audaciousness of, some of, the, of, of the audacity of some of the, uh, some of the ideas that were floating around. I also want to pay tribute to Ken, and he was far, far too modest in terms of anecdotes. Ken's bucket, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ken, Ken's bucket actually exploded as he put him together in the hotel room. But the remarkable, the remarkable thing was that Ken managed to talk his way out of it, saying it was a, a fireworks celebration on the street that had made the noise when someone was going to investigate. And there are wonderful similar stories. I think the Bell Brothers, who I'm thinking of meeting for the first time, have, a, have, a, have a, a, an also a similarly amazing story, when they're also, I think this is more or less correct, they're also interrupted as they're putting together the uh, equipment in their hotel room by a chambermaid. It was great. Okay. Anyway, it's a brilliant story. I beg your pardon. It's a brilliant story, and uh, the chamberlain interrupts them, and they manage to talk her around, because obviously she's a black worker. They talk her around very quickly to say, "We're here in your cause," and she accepts that. And they took a gamble that she maintained the secret, and she did maintain the secret. So that was absolutely extraordinary. And I, I just think, you know, the, 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 in many ways, the anecdotes are as exciting as the kind of straightforward descriptions that, uh, that, the, that all of us who have written for it um, try to get across. I just want to pursue the, uh, the Trotskyists and the Stalinist uh, alliance that we... <laughs> now, obviously, on both sides, we didn't know about this alliance. I'll come back to it in a moment. Uh, um, and Ronnie, you know, Ronnie was, in quotes, the only Stalinist in the student movement, which grew very quickly. Incidentally, on a more serious point, uh, one of the reasons why the LSD did get involved, there was a very direct South African link. The, we were, had the good fortune to, to, to launch the first student sit-in in 1967, but the trigger for the sit-in was the attempt by the LSD to appoint a director from what was then the illegal white, regi white, white Rhodesian regime. And uh, we rebelled against this, and that sparked the first sit-in. So there's a, a strong atmosphere for fighting racism in Southern Africa, and apartheid in particular. So it was relatively easy. I mean, it was, it was a fantastic, in a sense, hunting ground, if that's the right phrase, for Ronnie to begin to recruit. But Ronnie was, in quotes, the only Stalinist amongst this sort of bed of Trotskyists and anarchists. And uh, as he describes, well, what you see with Ronnie is what you get. And whatever the differences were politically, uh, the, sort of the affability of the guy, was very important in getting, a, getting across the message he wanted to get across and to kind of break down the kind of living network. Well, serious political arguments, but also inevitably a degree of sectarianism. Um, but it, for me, it's a fantastic irony that we all thought we were revolutionaries, but in the end, the only one to actually make a revolution was the old Stalinist revolutionary here. So, <laughs> um, fantastic that that happened. The, uh, I want to make just two further points about the politics of this. The student movement 
took off very rapidly. The high point for all of us was the French events in 1968. And we all thought that was the trigger for the revolution. But after that, it was all downhill. Up went the rocket, it goes up like a rocket, but comes down like a stick. And in a way, the, the prospect of, as we're all about to leave in 1968, 1969 university, having been through this extraordinary experience, the prospect of continuing revolutionary activity in this extraordinary way that Ronnie was offering was a factor in decisions to go ahead. I mean, nice to say it was just about courage and the commitment, but it was also some sense that we were also that we were extending a, a revolutionary commitment to a revolutionary movement. I want to pay finally, I want to pay a serious point about the Trotskys and Stalins. I actually want to pay tribute to the Young Communist League, and I've now met them as the old Communist League. <laughs> um, but I do want to pay tribute in a very specific way, in a very political way. One of the exciting uh, 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 dynamics and demands of the revolutionary student movement was for a student worker alliance. And I never knew, after all these years until I read the book, that as a matter of fact, Ronnie's recruits of Trotskys and Stalinists put together the student worker alliance thing. Every single uh, member of the Young Communist League, they weren't actually workers, they come from working class families, working class backgrounds. So we really were a student worker alliance in those days, and, and that's one of our strengths in, in, in my opinion. Very, very finally, I want to pay tribute to several, I'm not going to name them because I'd be embarrassed, but one name I'm going to mention, several of my comrades from the LSE who are in the room tonight, they all played really magnificent roles and their stories are also in the book, but I want to pay particular tribute to my cousin Catherine Levine, one of the very few women to be involved in the uh, 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 movement into South Africa, but she also, I was, I was in and out twice in two weeks, Catherine was there for three months ferrying guerrillas and smuggling arms across the border. It's an extraordinary, uh, uh, extraordinary brave thing to do. I'm not sure that I would have done that. Uh, and she did do it. And fortunately, she is still here to, to tell the tale. And I'll, I'll pay sp special tribute to her. Chair, thank you very much. Thank you. years by then, 
and I'd met some amazing people, and I'd heard some dreadful stories, and I'd been to South Africa. I went as a volunteer to Swaziland in 1964. During the Rivonia trial to a school where one of the children there, a very unhappy child, his father was one of the people on trial with Nelson Mandela. So that was the start, and the school was full of young South Africans who'd run away from the townships to come to the school, and many of them then went on to Tanzania. And I'll come to that later. But on the way, I went with a friend from school. It was a very long journey in those days. And on the plane flying over Angola, this young Johannesburg doctor had decided to take these two young women under his um, wing, very much reluctantly on our part. And he said, look, 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 look down there. Can you see? Can you see? There isn't a human being here for hundreds of miles, only animals and natives. <laughs> and then we got to South Africa go through South Africa to get to Swaziland. And what happened? We got lost in the non-white part of the Johannesburg station the first day. And I felt, actually, I think I belong here a lot more than in that great big fancy house we're staying in. So there was a personal journey, very much. And I was angry, and I remained angry. I mean, it kept on being angry. Um, then I went to university, and one of the people studying anthropology with me, or doing his PhD in anthropology, when I was a raw young undergraduate, was one of the finest intellectuals of, from South Africa for the whole of Africa, and that's Archie Mafeji, Professor Archie Mafeji, who remained a lifelong friend until he died very sadly some years back. But he was an enormous influence on me. He questioned me, he, he needled me, he made me think, he made me look at things differently all the way through. And then, I went to Tanzania to do field work. Well, Tanzania in the late 60s was the political center of Africa, actually of revolutions in most places. The Vietnamese were there, African Americans were there, um, Walter Rodney and others from the Caribbean were there, and it was a huge education. I did very badly in my anthropology, but I did very well in my political education there. And I met people that I met the ANC, as, as you know, were there at the time, were based there. And I met a lot of people, a lot of ordinary carders from the camps, who were with, I, I worked out later, and con they were with and gone to way. They were stuck in Tanzania. They were exceptional and very ordinary. There was that combination of someone you might meet anywhere, but they'd made this extraordinary commitment. So when my cousin John, when I got back, and quite reluctantly, I didn't want to leave Tanzania, when I got back, and my cousin came and said, did I want to go on this mission? I was absolutely petrified. But I thought, yeah, I do. And I'm very, very glad I did. I'm very glad I did, and I think it was a... I'm proud of what I did, as I think many of the others here are. I think it spurred me to live my life differently, and I hope I continue to do so. Um, I would like to disagree, or well, take issue with you, Ken, on one thing. I also have grandchildren who are part Muslim. I have children who are part Muslim. And I would say racism has not got better. Racism at the moment is actually getting worse here and in the West. I think there's a lot of work to be done. And I think that the lessons that we learn from the South African struggle need to be carried far and wide. We'll take a couple more of the recruits, because I want to leave a little time for questions and comment from the floor. Um, Sean, would you say a few words? And yeah. then Mary, would you say a few words too? Thanks. <coughs> This is unplanned, but the likes of us don't get much of an opportunity to take hold of this place, do we? So we may have to do it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Sean Hosey, um, and my story in many respects is very similar to the other recruits. I did much of the same uh, things they did, except on one occasion things went wrong, which I'm sure most of you are aware. And myself and Alex Mbaras were arrested and subsequently spent time in prison. 
It's important to add that there were six of us convicted as part of that uh, operation. Uh, four black comrades, Alex and myself, and the total prison sentence dished out to six of us was 77 years in total. 15 years for the black comrades, 12 for Alex and five for me. Now I went with my friend here, Steve, on the first mission and we did the bucket bombs in the way we've heard from others. And we also had not an amusing experience, but an experience which I suppose reflects that even though we had been part of anti-apartheid and communists, that when we got there, even we still did not understand properly the situation. So part of our mission was to mix in, and we did. And being you know, young, unattached men, we befriended a couple of young girls, young women, and we took them, they, or they took us to dinner. And whilst we were eating our dinner in a white sunny restaurant, we noticed the uniformed policeman came in, and the two women instantly froze. And we didn't quite know why. And we said, what's the matter? And they said, no, 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 just act normal, eat your dinner, and we'll tell you later. And they watched the policeman very carefully. He left the, uh, the, the restaurant, and later they told us the reason they felt so petrified. And because, uh, you know, they looked perfectly like any other person did to us, but they said, no, we're classified as colours. And we couldn't, we didn't have the right, legal right to be in that restaurant with you. Well, all sorts of thoughts went through our head. Of course, you know, it was the day before our mission, and if we'd blown it on that basis, Ronnie would not have been happy with us. <laughs> Fortunately, we didn't. So, on a more serious note, and I, I, I want to say one or two things. If people heard the interview on Saturday Live a couple of weeks ago, then I'm sorry if I'm repeating just a couple of things briefly, if I may, of course. Um, when I eventually got uh, into prison proper and had the honour, and I still consider it an honour, to meet other comrades who were in prison. I mean, I'm sure most of you know, their racism knew no bounds, so they separated white political prisoners from black political prisoners, black political prisoners in Robben Island, the rest of us in Pretoria. And I had the great honour of meeting some wonderful, wonderful people, who I'll mention a couple of briefly, Brian Fisher, and the father of the young lady who's there, David Rabkin, for a couple of years, and others. But People like Dennis Goldberg, who subsequently served 23 years, and Dave Kitson, who served huge periods in prison, said to me, how long have you got? I said, five years. I said, Christ, that's a parking ticket, back. <laughs> <laughs> that's a parking ticket. Um, I did, however, serve some time in, in, in the dark regions of Pretoria maximum security, where, which was death row, in fact. And the, I, I, I did tell the story the week, but it bears telling it again. Because that place will forever, in my mind, be a microcosm of everything that apartheid was about. And then, at, at all times, you had approximately 100 people, black people, waiting to be hanged at any one time. Thursday was generally hanging day, and they would get notification from the state president, usually on a Tuesday afternoon, with their preposterously inappropriate uh, words, greetings. <laughs> greetings, here is your death warrant. And he would name the seven or eight people who would be taken out on the Thursday. Now, those people would be separated, and indeed were hanged on the Thursday. But what I want to say is, between the Tuesday afternoon and the Thursday morning at 6 o'clock, when they were hanged, every other prisoner in place broke into a spontaneous song of support. Music, which was so incredibly moving, Ronnie, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. The, the collective voices of people in support of those who were about to be taken away and hanged. And that, to me, will always stay in my head as a microcosm of apartheid South Africa. All the guards, of course, were white, in the main, young Afrikaner men. And the effect that it had on some of them was so preposterous, it hardly bears telling. But I will tell you, two of them told me that so hooked, like a drug, were they on the process of seeing people hanged, that they hadn't missed hanging for six years. They even came in from their leave to witness the physical act of the hanging of people. Now, that, that is a terrible thing, but an interesting thing, and, and those are things that stay with me forever. Just finally, if I may. Of course. You've got more than a pocket. One of the, <laughs> one of the people um, that I had the pleasure of meeting was Brian Fisher, who... I, Part of my prison sentence was, in fact, the last two or three years of Brown's life. 
And I don't know if this story's been told. I know Dennis has, will have probably mentioned it. I don't know if he mentioned it in his book, Ronnie. But I bear witness to the fact that Bra Bram Fischer, a great Afrikaner, many feel could have been anything had he maintained his, uh, his belief or his support of, of apartheid and racism, could have been, risen to extremely high office, chose the opposite course, chose to say, no, this is wrong and I'm going to fight it, helped defend Mandela and was in prison for life and almost died apart from a couple of weeks, three weeks, I think, when he was released into his brother's custody, had cancer. Now, we were all kept in individual cells. Poor Brown was, was terminally ill. And, but they detested him so much that they wouldn't allow any of us in to assist him in the course of an evening when we could hear him falling out of bed, crashing his head against the wall. Barbaric. Now, I, it's a terrible thing, but I feel I have to share it with you. It's the truth, and people should know. And I didn't write it in the book, and I haven't told anybody else that. But tonight is the appropriate time, perhaps, to share it. Terrible, unforgivable things were done. However, that's gone. And let me conclude by saying, especially in this building, that at a time when we seem to hear almost daily accounts of greed, corruption, some of it from this place, but from many places who call ourselves themselves our moral leaders, let me tell you that it's an immense sense of pride to be sitting in a room with lots of people whose principles are very different to that, whose principles are, as Ken's talked about, of international solidarity, of support for other people, and of care for other people beyond greed and beyond self-gain. That, to me, is a great source of pride. Thank you. South Africa haven't forgotten you, and thanks so much for what you've had to say here today. Um, Mary, can we turn to you, Mary Chamberlain? Yeah. Uh, I haven't come, I haven't expected to I talk hope I haven't put you on the spot. Do you want to stay in? No, right, okay. <laughs> well, I haven't expected to talk tonight, so I have nothing prepared, um, and in many ways I think what Catherine and Sean have said have, you know, they, they've said everything that one could possibly say, made all the appropriate points. Um, and I, I, you know, I can't really add to that. I, I just want to say, um, just on a personal level, that I find this whole journey enormously emotional. Um, because, you know, as Kat said, um, the silence has been buried within us. And actually, I want to thank Sean and Ronnie and everyone for allowing, you know, for giving us permission, actually, to talk about it. And also to show to other people, and again, it's a point that you know, we, we've all made, I mean, just the importance <coughs> of, you know, we were, we, were one, we were individuals, we were tiny, tiny people. You know, this is the first time, I mean, I've met most of the others, but we were all working in the common cause, and it was the solidarity that I think is the, you know, one of the messages that, that really we want to come through. I think the other message, and I'm, I'm grateful to, to Catherine for talking and for Ronnie for asking this, there were many women involved in this. Um, Joy, my colleague here, and I say colleague because um, we team taught together, we taught the same course, the London School of Printing, for 10 years. We shared an office for 10 years, and I didn't know until Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
Um, but we, we went out um, and we were emigrating. Uh, we went out on the SS Bar, which we worked out with the woman who was working at the time, with packing cases um, full of SACP um, short histories and comics, which Christopher, what were they called? John and Susan? Oh, uh, story. Simon, Simon and Jane. Simon and Jane. Political comics. Political, Political comics. Comics, yes, um, which we, we then had to distribute. Nothing, of course, ever goes to plan. Um, all the information that Ronnie had given us sort of proved to be a little bit awry. Not these packing cases, which when we saw them in the bonded warehouse, God knows how many were there, had a very neat line of nails and about four inches above um, you know, the, the base of it. So, oh, <laughs> um, oh dear. What, you know, that all of them had false bottoms. There were endless stories like that. The policeman who helped me with the cases as I was going into the car in the flat and said to me, Are you going away? And I said, Yes, you know, we're looking at your lovely country. And he lifted it up as we got out and said, Let me help you with this. And it was the classic thing, What do you women have in this? <laughs> <laughs> Sarah Griffiths from the London School of Economics, and um, this is a pseudonym, uh, Alice McCarthy and her daughter's here. Where's Alice's daughter? There we are, the mother couldn't come. And Alice has written the most wonderful piece about having been recruited through her husband-to-be, who was in the Young Communist League, and she describes in this lovely account how as an 18 year old or 19 year old, Ronnie must have thought of this 18 year old from the East End of London with false eyelashes and a mini skirt. And I said to her, that's exactly how you've got to dress in South Africa. <laughs> um, they're very touching stories, all of them, undoubtedly. But um, with the little time that we've left, we could open this up for some comments and questions. Thank you. Would you like to just indicate who you are in case you're a missing recruit? <laughs> and uh, please, thanks. I, I will go former member of the Party Question. I just wanted to make the mention of Alan Brooks, yeah. who, whose victory appeared in the garden. Um, not only was he captured and did time in South Africa, but he was tortured. He then went on to direct or help the um, Angola, Mozambique, Guinea uh, liberation from what we got in the wrong order. Um, and I knew his mother-in-law in my local community relations <coughs> council, a very, very revolutionary organization. Uh, she was a member of the Methodist Church, both for me. Um, the other point is, uh, I've been a long, I certainly was a long-term member of the movement for colonial freedom, after the anti-Nazi later. Uh, now liberation, I have to say, it gave birth to many anti-racist and, and, and anti-colonial organisations. Um, and I noticed in the Morning Star today there's an advert for the organisation. It's got a, a fundraising dinner on the 14th of July. You want. Um, the other point, the last point I would say, uh, Ken mentioned that his parents 
were allowed to travel according to their passport anywhere except in the British Empire, according to the passport. Um, I recollect that Jack Waddis, who wrote the material for Moon Colonial Freedom, he was in the Merchant Navy, he travelled everywhere, including the British Empire, and I believe I remember reading that every time he came to a port, he went to the local souk and spoke, including to many future leaders. So that's the reason why your parents were not allowed to travel <laughs> in, uh, in the British Empire. That's all I've got to say. Thank you. Would you stand and speak? Well, of course, that's a subject for another book and another meeting. <laughs> I do read my updated Armed and Dangerous, and I describe my career as a po uh, poacher turned gamekeeper. But they destroyed everything. Anything that was operational was destroyed. So when I became Deputy Defence Minister, I went along to military intelligence, I sat at the computers, I put in the name Joe Slovo, and out spewed hundreds and hundreds of pages of his speeches, nothing else. <laughs> so they destroyed everything. Are you scratching your nose? <laughs> Thanks. I'm the other party to uh, Alice and James, and uh, I brought with me one thing that one book that I smuggled back into the country, which, is, which I brought with me here, so I can actually pick them with people and have a look at it. Um, but also, another thing I wanted to say was that, that I know that all the people who have gone over to South Africa, I'm sure it's affected all their lives. I know it's affected my life. From the moment I came back, it changed the way I chose to do things throughout the rest of the, rest of the time. Um, but it was even more, more effective because as soon as I got back, I was sacked. I started this organisation and you are gone, but said they didn't like the idea of me going to South Australia. That's just enough. <laughs> Is that James? Yes. That's James. Yes. You look very different. <laughs> <laughs> very nice to meet you again, my friend. We've been looking for you. I'd like to speak to you afterwards. Was there a hand over there? Sorry, the, the, I think uh, I heard a lady. Did, did you say? I thought a lady back there was two hands. Okay, that's, okay, that's fine. Then George Bridge is over okay, here. Yeah, I'm George Bridge. Uh, I was the London District Secretary, young obviously. I think I was the first recruiter. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very proud of that, obviously. Actually, there's an interesting story about how we met in the yeah, book. Um, part of my uh, job, <laughs> or punishment perhaps, was to be sent to a, a World Federation Democratic Youth Conference in Bulgaria. <laughs> On the way out, <laughs> I was called into a detention room by the police there, and for about an hour I was questioned generally uh, about things, and at the end of it they said, well, we were going to arrest you for being uh, one of the escaped great train robbers. <laughs> <laughs> but you're, you're too short. <laughs> so, feeling a bit shaken, I got on the airport bus and looked around, and there was this friendly face, you know. Somebody that you couldn't help but get on with, but ever since then we've got on with people. Um, I, I just want to make three quick points for you from that. Three, three, only three points. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we're going to have a three points. We're going to have a point on a 1967 ICL conference. Last time One of the sort of bittersweet things about, about that is that the young Communist League could never really take the credit for what we did at that time because of the secrecy. So we were sometimes accused of selling out the world revolution and all that stuff, whereas in fact we were doing a lot of revolutionary work at the time. And I'm really, really proud of that. And one of the things that I'm proud of, and Bob will um, bear me out on this, that everybody that we approached and asked to go agreed to go. And I know you found some others later on, but I'm talking about the young communists that Bob and I asked. And that, I think that was a testament to the commitment, because we shared this thing of hating racism and hating apartheid in particular. Which brings me on to the, the next point. Uh, I'm, I'm going to challenge this dichotomy between Stalinists uh, <laughs> and Trots because there were three of us in this marriage, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> the Young Communist at that time was not a Stalinist organisation. We were fighting against the ideas of Stalinism. There were people in the Young Communist League that uh, perhaps did agree with Stalinist position. 
and they, we recruited them as well. So, I mean, that's, again, part of the testimony to Ronnie's genius of uh, patience and tolerance and all the rest of it, that he could bring these people together in a joint cause. And one of the uh, best meetings that we've had in this whole process was at the SWP Marxism <coughs> University thing, where Ronnie spoke to about a similar sized group of people, most of whom I assume were sympathetic to Trotsky generally. And at the end of that meeting, Ronnie got a standing ovation. As a self-proclaimed Stalinist, <laughs> I think that was terrific. It was a great, great, great meeting. And the last point I want to make really is, when we went to South Africa, and we were fated in the way that Ronnie said, and that was quite embarrassing sometimes, because we'd been to the museum and we'd seen the cells, the solitary confinement cells that I think Sean did about eight months in, is that right? Something like that. We'd seen these nooses that Sean referred to, and we'd seen the memorial at Ravonia Museum to thousands and thousands of the uh, armed struggle uh, in the jungle and all the rest of it there. And it really brought into perspective the difference between what we did, which was important, and would underestimate that, and the real, real, real heroes of that time, which were the people of South Africa from all different races, from all different races. Thanks, thank you. Please, Ross, I was the editor of Challenge at about the time we were talking about the Young Communist magazine, and I'm amazed when I read the book and started to talk to people how much I didn't know. Uh, I gathered some of us, Anne and I, my wife here, um, we bred, and because we bred, uh, I, we weren't invited to go, and I'm so glad we weren't, <laughs> because I'm not sure I was as brave as, as people here. Uh, and people with young children weren't invited, I understand, and, and thanks for that. I just want to correct, uh, a lot of people here have been making a mistake tonight. A lot of people who went said how small they were. These people were giants, giants in the struggle, and we shouldn't forget that. Thank you. Just very, very we have to come to a close. Okay, Bob Newland. A lot has been said by a lot of people who participated uh, in, as London recruits. I was one of the fortunate few to not only have the privilege to have been a London recruit, but to have the privilege of going back uh, with uh, some of the other comrades and Ken and Ronnie launching the book in South Africa. And reference has been made to the way in which we were received and, and, and taken around. I want to pay tribute to some of the people who were just unbelievable. We met people who'd had 10 years on Rubin Island, hard labour, who were saying, comrades, thank you, you were an inspiration to us all. They got that wrong. So that comes on always right, Bonnie. They had that completely the wrong way around. These guys were just incredible. They suffered, many died. And I think South Africa, we saw South Africa at the crossroads. We were asked, including on the radio, despite our resistance to say, we weren't there to tell South Africa what to do and where they should go now. We felt our contribution was simply to do our little bit to help uh, make it possible for them to have opportunities which we have to shape their future. But it was the most extraordinary thing to see the humility of these people, and I include Ronnie in this, who doesn't get accused of humility very often, <laughs> but his contribution was just so extraordinary. And you know, as we walked around the streets, it came out of our hotel, wherever we went, people were coming up and saying, Ronnie, Ronnie, from all over the place, and running across. You know, he must be now, he might have been one of the most wanted people many years ago under apartheid, but he must be one of the most well-known people in South Africa uh, today on the basis of the extent to which that was. And I want to pay tribute to what Ronnie did uh, in exile, living a very difficult life, going back and forth underground in South Africa, but making it possible for us to make our small contribution. Thank you. I came back from my trip, I got involved, there was a group of us who'd been in Tanzania, 
and we started a journal, which some of you may know, called the Review of African Political Economy, with Ruth first and various other people. And we had, hadn't got a clue how, we were full of ideas, but we hadn't got a clue how to publish. And a very inspired and kind and good left-wing publisher called Martin Eve took us under his wing. And he was the founder of Merlin Press. So from my, from my point of view, it's rather wonderful to have Merlin Press publishing the book, and I think we should thank them. Tony is a book over there of Merlin Press. Before I wind up, um, all the books have been sold. Yeah. All have been sold here. All the ones we've had. We've got one left. You've got one left. <laughs> uh, Tony, would you just like to indicate how people can acquire more copies? Um, you can go into any bookshop anywhere in the UK and they will get copies for you. It's available in some bookshops in London. Thanks so much. Um, you've heard the accounts of recruits here. And I would say one of the ways that you could really help, um, help to project what they did and why they did it, and that's all about the South African story on the one hand, but it's about internationalism, solidarity, it's about human values on the other. Um, and a great way to help to sustain this book would be to ask you all to do everything you can to be uh, couriers of this book. Now, I'm not giving you suitcases with false bottoms. <laughs> I'm asking you to really, genuinely, it's something that you can do. Because I think this book tells a fantastic story. And more and more people in this country and elsewhere, including High Commissioner in South Africa, where it's been so well received. Um, help us to really give this book the legs that it deserves. I want to pay tribute to all of those who assisted with this book. And we're talking about really unsung heroes and heroines. There is an unsung heroine here tonight in the corner over there called June Stevens. And June helped me and helped so many of the ANC MK comrades within Swaziland and within South Africa. She was working in Mozambique with her late husband Michael. And I met her there. They were great friends of L.B. Sachs. And they had finished their tour of duty in Mozambique and were coming back home. And I asked them whether they would be prepared, after coming back to Britain, to come out and work in Swaziland as teachers. June got a job at the university and Michael in one of the schools, and they were there for many years. They did absolutely incredible things. And one of the most amazing things they did was to help our current Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs infiltrate into the country. He was nearly captured. They went in, and they helped to spirit him out of the country, hidden in a uh, cupboard which they had built in, one, in, in, in a combi van that they drove. Uh, they really risked so much. They did so much for me, and I'll never ever forget that, June. I'm absolutely so pleased that you've managed to come down from Oxford, and we think about you so often. And as I've said to Sean, we'll never ever forget what you have done, and what so many courageous, unsung heroes and heroines have done 
for the South African struggle. As Mandela has said, history is not about the kings and the emperors and the generals. It's about ordinary people who have changed history. And he's made that tribute to the ordinary people, not just of South Africa, but of those who helped us in our struggle, people who are very modest, modest South Africans, modest internationalists, modest people of all countries and of all struggles. And really, this book stands as a testament to, you've heard the voices here, people who are unsung heroes and heroines. They're not ordinary, but they would be classed as ordinary. They are, if I can use Shelley's terminology, these are the lions, the lions that rise after the massacres. So thanks to them, and High Commissioner, a word or two from you, if you like. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to come here today to participate in this uh, story telling and uh, in the review of this book. To the majority of South Africans, especially in the ANC. They don't forget what the people of Britain have done for South Africa. Uh, I understand in October there is a um, Comrade Zuma is supposed to come here, the President, to come and thank the people of Britain for what they have done in the liberation of South Africa. So you are a special group. You are not only uh, demonstrating and fighting against apartheid, but you were brave enough, courageous enough to be able to go into South Africa when there was a time that we never thought there could be anybody who would go into South Africa except to go through the routes that we used to buy a Mozambique and Zimbabwe, whatever it is. So on behalf of the people of South Africa, on behalf of the African National Congress, and I can say also on behalf of the government of South Africa, we thank you for what you have done. Uh, we hope, I don't want to close this thing, but we hope when Zuma is here, he might be able, we will force him to be part and parcel of looking at this book and uh, to thank you on behalf of the African National Congress and the people of South Africa for what you have done. It might seem to you all I can understand. You are all joking about it. But in the final analysis, it was a very great act that you did for our people. And I would say uh, it was bravery at its best. You might not have been carrying guns or something like that. But to have gone to South Africa at that time and to find yourself in that situation of South Africa under apartheid, you really solved, I think, the whole thing. Ronnie said that you've gone to South Africa over with this. Yes. Yeah. I, I wish we could do that more, not only in Jonas, but like Portland, South Africa. Cape Town, but also to go to the other areas of South Africa, to be able to <coughs> explain to the people that it of the, the people that fought were not only South Africans, but there were many people who gave their lives in the struggle against apartheid. I'm sorry to say it, but the question it is, the very fact that you were there, you're all from Britain, and you were all white, at that time. It would show our people, ordinary peasants, the ordinary workers, that uh, not all white people at that time were bad, like the apartheid state. But there were those that were with us in the trenches of the struggle against apartheid. On behalf of our people, we thank you. We hope we will be able 
to work together to be able to win the battles that we're fighting against poverty, unemployment, and hunger in our country. Thanks a lot. There's one cook remaining. <laughs> Don't rush the man. <laughs> Thanks so much indeed for coming here tonight and for being such a wonderful audience. Thank you.